Again, good afternoon and aloha. Before we get started, we would like to thank one of our supporting partners, Trace Systems, represented by Jeremy Ross, for their participation with this event. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon's keynote speaker is Rear Admiral Peter Gautier, Deputy Commander, Pacific Area, U.S. Coast Guard. Rear Admiral Peter Gautier assumed the duties of Deputy Commander Coast Guard Pacific Area in July 2020. As Deputy Commander, he is responsible for all U.S. Coast Guard missions within the geographic region that span from the Rocky Mountains west to the waters off the eastern coast of Africa. Rear Admiral Gautier previous, previously served as Commander, Coast Guard 11th District in Almeida, California from June 2018 to July 2020, where he directed all Coast Guard missions in California and Eastern Pacific Ocean. During this assignment, he also served as Deputy Director for the Department of Homeland Security's Joint Task Force West, conducting integrated joint investigations and operations along the southern border and approaches from the Texas to California. Rear, Admi Rear Admiral Gautier graduated from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy with a Bachelor's of Science in Marine Engineering. He holds a Master's of Chemical Engineering degree from the University of Michigan and a Master's of National Security Strategy from the National War College. If you have any questions for the Admiral, please text those to the address located on the screen. Please join me in a warm welcome for this afternoon's guest, note, guest speaker, Rear Admiral Peter Gautier. Hey, thanks very much. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I, I can tell we have the disciplined crowd here because you all found your way across the street. Um, you uh, left your lunches and you got here on time for my keynote, so I deeply appreciate that. Um, let me express my sincere appreciation, uh, Madam President, uh, for the invitation here. Linda, Cynthia, um, Admiral Mackey, uh, and for the entire organization for inviting me, inviting a Coast, Guard, a Coast Guardsman here to speak. I understand it's been some number of years since you've had a Coast Guard speaker. There tend to be very few of us here on island, and it is, uh, it is a ways to go for um, folks like me to travel out of the area, but um, this is just a special opportunity for me to, um, to speak to you, uh, to speak to this audience today. Um, and so as I think that about um, the theme of this conference and the relevance of what previous speakers have said, I think about what Admiral Paparo said here yesterday at this very time at the opening keynote. I think all of you heard that keynote address, I hope. It was a packed room. It was a terrific turnout. And it was wonderful to see everybody returning in person after a number of years away because of COVID. But I think what really came through was the strategy of integrated credible deterrence against our pacing and other adversaries in the region and globally. Um, and I think that statement and that thought, that strategy, I would submit um, was a great way of getting started with uh, this conference and probably spurred similar conversations, if not up here at the podiums, but also in the hallways and that, then on the expo, expo floor as well. And he also men mentioned maximizing the ability to understand the decision space and degrade the enemy's ability at the critical time of consequence. So, what I hope to do, what I hope to convince you of in the next few minutes, is the Coast Guard's role in that credible integrated deterrence strategy, but how we do this differently and in a complementary fashion to our Department of Defense counterparts. Now make no mistake, we are very proud of fundamentally being a military service in the United States Coast Guard. We're proud to be Title 10. We fought in all the nation's wars alongside our fellows of the other uh, uh, DOD um, services. Um, but we provide a different sort of value proposition in our geostrategic imperatives in this conflict that we find ourselves in. Now our commandant, Admiral Schultz, uh, expresses this in a way where he talks about the Coast Guard as being a bridge between the departments of, of state's diplomacy and Department of Defense's lethality. Um, but, you know, this really um, expresses us as a combination of not just a military service, but also a law enforcement agency, a humanitarian service, a regulatory agency, 
that protects our maritime transportation system and guards our economy. Uh, and we're also an environmental steward through our pollution response uh, roles and responsibilities that we have. And together with that, we have a very powerful suite of authorities that help us provide something special and complementary in the strategy uh, that DOD has articulated. So what we offer is this. As the Department of Defense provides consequences to negative behaviors that tries to, through integrated credible deterrence, prevent bad actions on the part of our adversaries, what the Coast Guard does is that we model good behaviors. We uh, model adherence to the rules-based international order in the maritime and increasingly in the cyber domains that provides all nations an opportunity for their, to guard their own sovereignty and to um, have the security and prosperity that is only limited by their own abilities. In short, we model the free and open Indo-Pacific in the United States Coast Guard. Um, against, and uh, as you heard yesterday, we provide a values-based alternative to the coercive and bullying actions on the part of our adversaries in the region and globally. Now, when I speak to an audience, I never presume that they know everything about what the Coast Guard does operationally. Um, we just had a congressional delegation that rolled here through uh, Honolulu, and I think they were really impressed at how much the Coast Guard does in this geostrategic struggle against China, Russia, and our other adversaries. So let me just take a moment today and maybe walk you through current operations that the United States Coast Guard is doing in the region to illustrate that role on the value proposition that we add to the strategy. So as we gather today, as we speak, there are several Coast Guard cutters working hand in hand with the Canadian uh, Royal Navy in the Eastern Pacific operating off of Mexico, Central and South America in the counter drug fight. Um, we work very closely with SOUTHCOM, JAD of South, that integrates full scale um, law enforcement investigative information together with intelligence to provide the targeting necessary so we can position our maritime patrol aircraft and then our cutters, our Navy ships when they're out there with Coast Guard law enforcement detachments and our allied partners in the right places to make these seizures, to make these interdictions. This is going on right as we speak. I mention this because it's a model of whole of US government and international government approach on a values-based alternative that gets after a global problem that impacts all nations. And we know, uh, especially in Mexico, Central and South America, and also here in the Pacific region, the importance here is not that just the fact that last year we seized 173 tons of cocaine in the transit zone off of South America, but that also we deter and we disrupt transnational criminal, criminal organizations that would otherwise operate freely and take deeper root than they already have. And in so doing that, eroding the, uh, uh, the norms that exist within the countries, they, they um, create violence and uh, suffering in every step of the supply chain that they uh, participate in. But also um, they, uh, especially with weak government, they destabilize weak governance, weak governments in the region and around the globe. So this is an important example of how we all work together in this important fight against counter drug in order to stabilize and uh, um, strengthen governance in the region around the world. So moving on to the high latitudes. So this is an Indo-Pacific conference, but I will vouch that our adversaries also work uh, in the high latitudes in the Arctic Ocean and in and around Antarctica. So just four days ago, the Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star pulled back into the United States into uh, Northern California after a prolonged uh, patrol where they um, uh, broke out a channel into McMurdo Station, um, Antarctica's largest research station and our biggest U.S. Pr presence in Antarctica. They do this every year, minus last one, which was canceled because of COVID, in order to affect the resupply of that important state station uh, uh, deep in, uh, in the southern latitudes. Um, 
in so doing, they project U.S. presence and the values that we adhere to in those latitudes. Now, just the winter before, the Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star, for the first time in about 20 years, in the middle of winter, went through the Bering Strait and high up into the Chukchi Sea to patrol the international boundary between the United States and Russia. And we've got to remember, we actually do have a boundary between the United States and Russia. And in doing that, it patrolled, it exerted U.S. presence, it sailed through an international maritime organization recognized traffic separation scheme that's rather new. In fact, the Russians did not remember when they hailed the ship that this existed. They claimed that we were in their territorial seas and we needed to remove the cutter from their waters. We reminded them that this is an internationally sanctioned traffic separation scheme and they relented. They overflew us. But um, we also exercised regular protocols that we have with the Russian border guard between, our, between them and our Coast Guard 17th District to make sure that we have predictability in that relationship, even as Russia invades their neighbor. We have, have to have this relationship at the tactical level to ensure that we have this stable presence on the border that we share um, between the United States and Russia. So let me move to, uh, oh, and by the way, the Coast Guard Cutter Polar Star was built in 1976. When we're here at a convention of technologists, when you look behind the circuit boards of that ship, you will see capacitors that are about three feet in diameter. You'll see inductors that are about that long and that you can't find anymore except on eBay. So um, the lesson here is that the Coast Guard hangs on to its assets for a very, very long time. Um, so let me talk now about um, Oceania and what's going on even here today. So uh, the U.S. Coast Guard is committed to increasing our presence here in this region to work more closely than we have even before as a long-term presence with Pacific Island nations to do the same thing that we do elsewhere, is to reinforce these international norms and through a network of agreements, bilateral, multilateral agreements with them, predominantly helping them enforce against uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. We strengthen our relationships and we uh, strengthen the norms that we, uh, and behaviors that uh, exist on, at the region in a values-based way. This year, the Coast Guard home ported three new fast response cutters in Guam, and we recoined our sector there as Coast Guard Forces Micronesia to demonstrate our long-term commitment to the region. Uh, and I think just like DOD is in Guam, we're only going to be investing more in the United States Coast Guard in that region. We have a major cutter doing an Oceania patrol now under an operation called Operation Blue Pacific. And I think um, we can commit to more presence, more engagement, and more advancement of governance in the Oceania re region, which is increasingly in contested by our adversaries. Likewise, we're operating more in the deep Pacific. We're now doing an annual Westpac um, under the TACON of 7th Fleet with regular transits through the Taiwan Strait, engagement with our Southeast Asian and East Asian nations to help them build their capacity and capabilities and again, reinforce these norms. Now, one of the reasons I'm able to be here is because I'm on my way back from Guam, where I co-hosted an engagement with Southeast Asian Coast Guards and Maritime Law Enforcement Agencies with the Philippines. It was called the Southeast Asia Maritime Law Enforcement Initiative and with the waning of COVID, uh, it was the right time to meet again in person with these important partners. And uh, what we do here is we enforce, uh, reinforce capacity building and capability building and information sharing with these countries in the Gulf of Thailand to help them confront that incredible challenge that they have there in the uh, South China Sea and elsewhere. And I have to tell you, there's a lot of hunger there for more U.S. Coast Guard engagement. All of this is underpinned by the recently published uh, White House Indo-Pacific Strategy, where the Coast Guard was named as an agency by name, uh, which talks about more Coast Guard presence and cooperation in Southeast and South Asia and the Pacific Islands with a focus on advising, training, deployment, and capacity building. So that is just a very quick 
travel around this region with Coast Guard activities that are happening there. There are a lot more, um, but for the sake of time, if you're interested, happy to answer any questions or continue that conversation during the Q&A. So this is uh, more of a technology conference than perhaps an operational conference. So suffice it to say that organizations like IFC are tremendously important in advancing the uh, concept of closer integration between the United States uh, military, between the United States Coast Guard, and industry. We have to do more of this. You heard it yesterday during the keynote. I will just reiterate that. We need to continue to advance and upgrade our capabilities with better systems that are targeted towards the things that we need to do to be better at operations and also to advance our own mission support capability so that we are more operationally ready to do the sorts of things that we need to do, to provide a competitive edge against our adversaries, but also just to provide the best services we possibly can to the American people. And so I wanna talk about two areas of technology that the Coast Guard is in increasingly investing in. We can talk about more of those again in the Q&A but uh, just give you a brief overview of these um, before I conclude. So let's talk about data um, for, for just a minute. I would vouch that like every agency, like all military service, services, there was a time in the recent past where we realized in the Coast Guard that our databases were old, they were not cyber secure, they were stovepiped, it required a lot of time by frontline operators with a lot of manual intervention in order to populate them. They wouldn't talk with one another. And then when we did get reports, it wasn't the kind of information that we needed at the frequency that we needed them. And so we're working hard to remedy that. And I think, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. I think we're all marching out into the future as quickly as we possibly can with the recognition that data provides that competitive edge as well. It's a tremendous capability if we manage it and employ it correctly. So two years ago, the Vice Commandant chartered a data readiness task force for the Coast Guard in order to examine this problem and chart a way forward. And as a result of that, we published the Coast Guard data strategy last year. And we are in the process of creating an office of data and analytics uh, here this fiscal year. And what we want them to do is create consistent standards for data management so it can be searched, shared, and analyzed more easily, no matter what system it's stored in. We're developing rules right now to gather data with more efficient environment that safeguards it, to enable our mission leaders to ask specific questions and get those answers that they need in the time that they need it. Um, rather than having to wait for an annual report or a quarterly report with, with uh, data that um, is old and not useful for the front end user, user on the tactical level, and then back in garrison for our operational planners in order to execute the mission. So modern computing is gonna be informed in the Coast Guard by a big data platform that we're calling Surveyor that's being developed by this office to integrate data across Coast Guard enterprise systems whether that be personnel systems, equipment readiness systems, um, the databases that um, we use in terms of capturing operational data. Not only to reduce the burden of ma manual data entry by field personnel, but also empower the workforce to make data informed decisions that push finite resources towards the highest threats to our marine environment and to our maritime security. So we had a saying that was coined by Admiral Zunkoff uh, a couple of commandants ago, who now lives here, uh, right here on uh, Oahu. He would always talk about um, intelligence-informed operations. The Coast Guard is moving towards data-informed operations that fuses intelligence with data in order to inform what we're gonna do, whether that be targeting the bad guys on the high seas, figuring out where to best place our assets in order to do search and rescue cases, or to guard and uh, preserve the integrity of our port, uh, port infrastructure. We're also enhancing our capabilities in cyberspace in accordance with our cyber strategic outlook that was just updated last year. So um, the Coast Guard is unique 
uh, in that um, first and foremost, we do have to guard our own networks. The Doden, just uh, the same as other um, DOD agencies do. But um, because we're, the, we're, in, we're within DHS and because we have Title 14 and other authorities, we're also assigned uh, another unique uh, role and responsibility. We are the sec sector risk management agency for safeguarding the marine transportation system. So DHS carves up our critical infrastructure into a series of critical infrastructure sectors, transportation being one, the maritime transportation system being a subsector of that one. So we are the lead federal agency in order to uh, assure that uh, that subsector uh, remains secure to physical threats as well as cyber attacks to protect the $5.4 trillion annual economic impact that our maritime transportation system facilitates. So how are we doing this? First of all, we know we have to develop the cyber workforce. A problem that we all have, a challenge that we all need to confront, but an opportunity that uh, we need to get after as well. So we are creating a new rate, the Cyber Mission Specialist. It's an enlisted rating in order to develop the talent, grow it, train it, and uh, as much as we possibly can retain it in order to do the tasks at hand. We're hiring 52 cyber specialists. They're civilians, and they'll be located at all of our sectors, our district offices, as well as our area commands. And those folks are going to interface directly with the maritime industry, whether that be vessel, vessel owners or operators, as well as um, uh, shoreside facilities that receive them uh, in order through our area maritime security uh, committees in order to exchange information do risk management, understand what, what's happening in the maritime transportation system, and then work together in order to harden our systems and then, if necessary, respond. In order to do that, we've created the first of uh, what we plan are, uh, will be more than one cyber protection team. These cyber protection teams are trained in accordance with the standards established by U.S. Cyber Command. And what they do is they'll go out on a collaborative basis by industry partners that volunteer to have them come in to examine their networks for intrusions. This is a voluntary program. And uh, so far, we've had lots of takers in order to have these CPTs go into their networks and scan them and look for intrusions. And we have indeed found those. Um, so they will assess, hunt, clear, and harden these private sector infrastructure uh, networks um, taking into account that 90% of our critical infrastructure is actually in the private sector. We also uh, are a proud uh, joint member of U.S. Cyber Command, providing our trained personnel who specialize in maritime transportation and uh, maritime security um, to help U.S. Cyber Command build the capacity and do the sorts of special missions, cyber operations that they do in that most important command. And I'll just leave that one at that. This is all part of our efforts in the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy to synchronize the capabilities, capacities, roles, and investments that we bring to the table as a naval service and as a member in the joint environment. Um, and we, th these are all works in progress. With rapidly changing technologies and capabilities, we know that we need to keep up here in the United States Coast Guard, and we're striving to do that. So why don't I leave it there so we can allow plenty of time for Q&A. So thank you. Thank you, sir. First question. Coast Guard District 14 probably has more friendly relations with China than any other service. Can you comment on that? So it's all part of being in the neighborhood, isn't it? Um, and by being an agency, that has a mission set um, that can be considered, for the lack of better words, wholesome, non-provocative, something that all countries need. It gives us access to a lot of places that the Department of Defense has. There was a time where we would do joint operations uh, with Chinese vessels to do uh, counter illegal, uh, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Because of the tensions between China and the United States, we have since stopped doing that. We do have uh, an operation called North Pacific Guard. It's an annual operation that happens 
uh, off of Japan and in the North Pacific, same thing for IEU fishing, that, that is part of the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum, which also includes China, Coast Guard, and Russia. Um, we do navigate carefully with these relationships given the geostrategic imperatives that uh, are at stake. And I have to say, there has not been a lot of interaction between the U.S. Coast Guard and China and Russia of late, except at the very tactical level. I will tell you, since you raise it, um, that we have strengthened our bonds with Taiwan. Uh, about a year ago, an MOU was signed between our State Department and uh, Taiwan's equivalent. And we, the United States Coast Guard, the executive agent, together with the Taiwan Coast Guard, to strengthen our relationships. Uh, trade information um, and explore what is within the realm of possible with Taiwan in a non-provocative way that just strengthens the law enforcement, search and rescue, and pollution response missions of both of us. Um, so we have done a number of engagements with Taiwan Coast Guard in order to do that. Thank you, sir. Next question. What is the future outlook for replacement of and or addition to your polar icebreakers? Um, I'm really pleased to say that the outlook is good. Um, <laughs> 1976, heavy icebreaker. 1999, our medium icebreaker. Those are the newest ones in the United States inventory, so it's about time. Um, but with the help of Congress and just a lot of engagement over many commandants and many senior leadership teams, I would say because of the changing geostrategic landscape, we now have tremendous support for Congress for building these. We have funding for, um, we're calling these polar, heavy polar security cutters. We have funding to build polar security cutter number one and number two, and then is happening now in VT Halter Shipyard down in Pascagoula, Mississippi. We are working on acquisition of long lead time materials for Polish Security Cutter 3. And we have established a requirement through a number of studies for four or three at least heavy icebreakers, Polish Security Cutters, and three Arctic security cutters that are more, uh, while the heavies are more uh, equipped to go south, the um, Arctic security cutters are, will be better designed to go north. In the meantime, some of you who, are, who follow budgets very carefully will see that in the President's 23 budget request, the Coast Guard has included a request to acquire a commercial icebreaker to bridge the gap between what we have today and what we uh, know that we will be getting um, at the completion of this acquisition. Uh, I think the National Security Establishment, Congress, and White House, and elsewhere sees this as um, a stern chase. When Russia has over 40 icebreakers, China has two, and building more, our Scandinavian partners have many more than we do, that we need to increase capacity quickly. Thank you, sir. Next question. How do you work with other Coast Guard organizations, for example, the Japanese Coast Guard, within this AOR to influence maritime security to deter or enforce when contested? Um, frequently and deeply. With the uh, Japan Coast Guard, Japanese Maritime Self-Defense -Def Force as well, uh, um, and other Coast Guards in the region, uh, we work very closely with them. Um, the first is, is that we have regular engagements. It's been virtual of late in order to enhance information sharing, capacity building, sharing lessons from our Coast Guards um, to enhance operations. We have uh, regular exchanges uh, in terms of training between the U.S. Coast Guard and the Japan Coast Guard. The Japan Coast Guard recently was off the coast of Hawaii and actually prosecuted a search and rescue case for us here. So they do make it far afield occasionally. Um, and I think we, we march forward um, based on a, a set of shared values uh, that are based in um, things that Coast Guards do. And just as we do this in Japan, like I said, I just got back with engagements for, from five Coast Guards from around Southeast Asian nations, same thing. Um, the uh, Korean Coast Guard as well. Now one difference that you'll find between the U.S. Coast Guard and a lot of these other Coast Guards is that they, they tend to guard their exclusive economic zones. 
and not go further afield than that. Um, with the threat in the region, we're seeing more of the regional Coast Guard's willing to go further afield to project, just as we do, uh, their national security values um, before they, uh, to, in order to assure their security before it reaches their shores. Thank you. What are your biggest challenges in sharing information with coalition partners? Well, there are the standard um, challenges that we have about sharing classified information, and it depends on the country. But through the intelligence community, we vet countries for the level of, secure, level of classification that we can share with them. We have become creative through our maritime intelligence fusion centers in crafting information in a way that we can provide at a declassified but sensitive level, just recognizing the importance of these partnerships. And by the way, we do this within the U.S. government as well. When we do a law enforcement mission that provides targeting based on intelligence, we have to validate that intelligence with our own eyeballs uh, because we cannot use classified systems to bring folks to court because that becomes discoverable. So we have gotten good at providing a firewall between classified systems and information in uh, scrubbing that in order to provide relevant information to our partners. What do you see as the biggest support the Coast Guard can provide to the Pacific Island nations? And what do you see as uh, the Pacific Island nation's greatest needs? So I turn to um, experts like Admiral Sibley, the District 14 commander and his staff and the staff in Guam, and his predecessors, Admiral Lunday and others going way back, Admiral Ray, um, in understanding the cultures of the Pacific Island nations and their capacities to ingest the assistance that we want to give them. This is the lesson that I always take away with conversations of subject matter experts on Pacific Island nations. So in making our assistance valuable to them, we need to have these engagements to be frequent with the same people so that these relationships can continue to strengthen and we need to provide them the assistance that matters to them. And so, you know, you'll find like, if you wanna provide um, a country a patrol boat, that might not be something that they can take in home port, maintain and operate. And so therefore there might be other assistance in terms of smaller boats or other assistance that, um, that they welcome more uh, that is targeted exactly to the sorts of needs they have. Well, there's nothing on my screen. That, oh, sorry. I don't know whether that means that there aren't any more questions. <laughs> no, we have, a, we have a few more. I was just running a little behind. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, Claire, can you put this one up, please? The great and powerful Oz has another question for me. <laughs> In Oceania, how can industry work with U.S. government agencies to assist Oceanic nations with their common operational picture so, so that they can better employ their limited resources to enforce and defend challenges to the sovereignty and economic enforcement zones? Yeah, good question. I think it comes back to the same, similar answer that I, I gave before. It is um, making the assistance targeted to what they ask for and what they need. Um, and our Pacific Island Nation experts can tell you that there is a, just a wide variety of, um, of uh, needs out there, and, and most of them are pretty fundamental, right? It's amazing to us how many search and rescue cases that we'll do that'll be multi-day cases that, per, that we do actually get a, a lot of Department of Defense help on with maritime patrol aircraft. And we still, and these will be little, you know, little pangas, little boats that'll go on island hopping and they won't, um, they won't make their arrival date. And we will search for days, weeks, and then we will find them alive on a, on a different island or in a different location than we were originally looking. I think there is value in maritime domain awareness, not, not, not just for Pacific Island nations, but for the enterprise. And I know that there are products that have been developed by the Navy and others to do that. Maybe what I'd offer is we need the data feeds 
that go onto some of these um, front end user interfaces that provide dark targeting capability, i.e., um, a lot of vessels emit AIS, automated information system. There are fishing fleets that uh, are required by their nations to emit VMS, but there are a lot of boats out there that don't emit anything, especially the, the bad guys. And to have data feeds of dark targets using satellite data or RF detection or whatever, you fill in the blank, um, the more we can get after that, the better. Thank you. We have a couple more questions in the queue. Uh, first up, what do you see as the bigger challenge for your technology modernization goals? Timely acquisition or implementation policy that doesn't necessarily, necessarily reflect cutting edge technology? So I, I, I forgot to a caveat up front then, I'm an operational guy. Um, but um, nevertheless, I'll, I'll, I will offer an opinion. Um, we're a small service with a humble budget. That is first and foremost challenge that we, that we face. And as we are about 50% through with the biggest recapitalization that we've had in our Coast Guard history, cutters going to an all C-130J air fleet, going to an all H-60 air fleet, and uh, recapitalizing our C-4I systems, we're doing this all at the same time. It is ability to squeeze in these technological advancements into a budget that gets squeezed by these major acquisitions and then these personnel management costs. So what we position ourselves to do is don't be overly in the research business. Take near or fully mature technologies, especially ones that DOD has invested in, that are mature and that have a track record so that we can then bring them over and integrate those into Coast Guard, uh, into Coast Guard capabilities. I will tell you that we're not nimble enough in doing this. Um, we have a history that dates back from a failed acquisition strategy called Deepwater, where we learned a tremendous amount of lessons. But in so doing, we've got a very structured acquisition requirement system that um, means that it's a little bit harder to turn on a dime when an opportunity presents itself to integrate a new technology. <laughs> Thank you, we have two more. First up, how did the ever forward run aground? Was it human error, systems failure, something else, all of the above, and will it be freed? So that happened on the other side of the Rocky Mountains, and that belongs to the Atlantic Area Command. Um, what I have, what I can share with you, I think that's an open, um, uh, that, that's an open source is that there was pilot error, or there, there, was, there was error in the pilot house in making a turn, and they got driven into the mud, and guess what, that stuff happens. Uh, we, have, we have groundings, and I think one like this catches a lot of attention um, because of the sister ship's uh, unfortunate Suez Canal incident. But I tell you what, that ship is stable. Um, it's not going anywhere, it's not leaking, and as a uh, maritime safety professional, the first thing you look at for is a stable situation. And then you don't feel the need to rush through the salvage calculations and then the efforts you need to do in order to refloat a ship. So I think they did some dredging, um, but it's, it's in the mud deep, and so they have to remove some containers in order to, um, uh, in order to um, decrease the draft and get, get that out of the mud that it's stuck in. It will be freed, yeah, absolutely. Um, some of you might remember one that didn't get freed. It was a car carrier uh, in South Carolina, or, or in Brunswick, Georgia, that um, um, took a turn too hard, was misloaded, and got some wind, and, it, and it, um, it capsized. That one got chopped into pieces and removed, like slices of bread. Thank you, and the final question, uh, could you maybe give some examples of how you're assisting other Coast Guard entities protect their ports using current and emerging technologies? Um, yeah, I think, uh, honestly, simplicity is king um, in assisting other Coast Guard entities. We do have a foreign, foreign military sales program. We do uh, traditionally, when we retire a cutter, 
We do have other countries, coast guards, where we transfer those cutters to. Vietnam, Sri Lanka, a number, number of other Southeast Asian nations. Those cutters are pretty simple because uh, most of them were built in the 60s and 70s, um, some in the 80s. Um, but again, I think, I know the Navy has done a tremendous amount in terms of maritime domain awareness through Sea Vision and perhaps other products and provide mar maritime domain awareness for um, a lot of these developing countries. Most of what we do is help them with their tactics, techniques, and procedures with how they should organize their maintenance programs, how they train their people, building Coast Guards from ground up. It's less so the technology aspect of things. Thanks, Admiral. What a tremendous mission these uh, Coast Guardies have. It's, we have a fondness here on Oahu and the other islands for Coast Guard because obviously we're all surrounded by water. And some of you folks back on the mainland may not appreciate them as much as we do out here. So I just want to thank you, Admiral, for that. And uh, on behalf of FCA and FC, our local chapter and FC International, we have a challenge coin we'll present to you. And this is our 37th year coin. So we're, we're pretty Great. proud of that. And uh, in lieu of a gift, we'll be sending a donation to our Windward Warrior uh, Ohana here. So we're, we'll be doing that uh, very shortly. And we asked the Admiral to stay up here.